Hi, so who's done property-based testing before? It's really bright up here, but it looks like there are a couple of hands raised, but only a couple. Who's heard of property-based testing? Because you read the, the slide for my <laughs> talk? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, how many are unit testing? Okay, almost everybody's raised their hand for that, so that's awesome. So generally, you would expect somebody talking about property-based testing to get up on stage and tell you how great Haskell is, which I would do, but that's not what they brought me in to talk about. Um, I'm not going to ask you to learn Haskell. I'm not going to ask you to do all that functional programming stuff that you may love or you may hate, you may be super turned off by. There is a property-based testing framework for every language, literally every language that you could possibly be working in. There will be a property-based testing framework for you. So I wanted to start the talk off just by letting you know that no matter where you're coming from, there's probably a way you can get into property-based testing. And here's what I'm gonna talk about today. Notice that it doesn't say anything about intro to property-based testing. I am not gonna give you the step-by-step -step details of how to use this specific framework that you're gonna go back tomorrow and start using. There are a million property-based testing talks out there on the web, Google it. You can find it, they're awesome. A ton of great speakers have put a lot of effort into telling you exactly how to use the framework that you will probably be using as of tomorrow. Um, what I am gonna talk about is the stuff that you're gonna learn, not, the stuff that I don't want you to have to learn the hard way. The stuff that you learn after doing this stuff for a few years and you say, you know what, it was really hard to get started, but once I did, it was, it was a great thing that I did. And I really appreciate the fact that I didn't have to learn that stuff the hard way. Um, so hopefully I can give you some of that content and get you inspired to go look at and see what you can be doing as soon as tomorrow. So I do want to give you a full disclosure. I am a consultant. I've been consulting for many, many years, and that kind of breaks people, you know. Um, I have many, many biases, and I think it's only fair to put those out in front of you so you know where I'm coming from in this talk. I absolutely love functional programming. Some people don't, and that's okay. I absolutely love code without bugs. I think most of you can say the same thing. My reasoning for that is because I don't want to get the call from the client who has a bug because the clients don't pay me to fix the bugs that I wrote. They pay me to write code that works. So when I break things, when I write code that doesn't work, I sometimes have to go in and fix it for free. And that's not fun for me. This may surprise a lot of people. I don't love testing. I know a lot of people see my name next to a testing talk and they're like, oh cool, a QA person up on stage, not a QA person. Don't love testing. Every line of code that I write is, is something I have to maintain or somebody has to maintain. Whether it's test code or production code, it is something that has a cost. And I don't like it when my clients have to call me and say, hey Amanda, that test broke. Because the answer is always the same, comment it out. That's what we all do. And I absolutely, the older I get, the more I don't believe in dogma in software. I used to be one of those people who bought into the TDD, 100% test coverage. Everything has to be written in a very specific way or it's not right. I no longer am that way. I can't stand on stage with any kind of good feeling and tell you you have to write everything in Haskell. But maybe you should try. So why do we test? So if you were in the keynote this morning, you heard the don't test just for the sake of testing. Okay, so why do we test? What, what do I wanna get out of testing? So Dijkstra says that tests don't prove the absence of bugs, um, they only show the presence. So what I wanna get out of writing a test is that if I've thought that a bug could occur, I will write a test to prove it, or to, to make me feel confident that it's not going to occur. That's really important to me. And another probably even more important reason for myself is documentation. I don't wanna write, I have to write pages and pages of documentation about my code. I like that the tests can do that for me. I like that if you read through my tests, you know the intent that I had when I was writing the code. And that of course gives me a love-hate relationship with unit tests. And I'll show you what I mean. So I spent a couple of years doing some research on uh, programming languages and frameworks, different ways to write code. I wanted to find the most elegant solutions to solve problems that will minimize the possibility of having bugs. Um, so I did something called a code kata. 
Code katas are these exercises that you can do over and over and over again in many different ways in order to achieve the same result. Or you can do it over and over and over again in the same way in order to achieve the same result. I found that I learned more from the first. So what I did was the bank OCR code kata. Um, essentially what you've got is a bunch of bank account numbers that are coming in via OCR and then you check with a checksum algorithm to ensure that they're valid or return if they're invalid. During my research, I got to work with a bunch of industry luminaries. It was really quite exciting to work with people like the guy who wrote this code, Jim Wyrick. You may know him from, um, he, he wrote something called Rake, uh, a Ruby build tool. The fact that he wrote Rake and the fact that he was so prominent in the Ruby, um, in the Ruby space made me know for sure that this code is awesome. These are the tests that he wrote to prove out his, or to feel confident in his implementation of the bank OCR code kata. So my first question when I saw it, when he handed this to me was, what are all those magic strings? Where did they come from? What are they supposed to mean? I'm not allowed to have magic strings in my code. Why am I allowed to have magic strings in my tests? Well, luckily I was working with a luminary because he had a comment. Comments are documentation. Or tests are documentation, but I've got a comment to document my document of my test. So it gets really confusing and sometimes you're not working with luminaries and they don't comment where the magic comes from. So that drives me crazy. I, I can't look at tests and, and not understand. I'm not going to understand the intent based on this. And also my next question is, what about these strings? Did he test those? Should we test those? I could write a million of these tests. And how will I know that I'm done? How will I know that I have enough? How will I know that I should have confidence in my code? So it, it always left me feeling a little bit uneasy. It's not something that makes me have any kind of real confidence in my code, especially since I end up commenting them out. So what if we could write something like this? What if we could write a property that would say that if I run all of these valid accounts through my checker, and it would run maybe 10 million of them, 10 million unit tests would run to, to give me the confidence in my code. How cool would that be? So I would be generating input to my tests. Why can't I generate input to my tests? Because it's bad. I've been told that it's bad. Generating tests or generating input for unit tests is a bad practice. This is something that I've been told is not the way you're supposed to write unit tests. So I find that with property-based tests, I start breaking rules, and that makes me feel good too. So what do we know about these, this, these bank account numbers? What do we know about them? How can we change the way we start to think about our tests? So here's the checksum. And here are the valid accounts. So let's start to look at what, what do we already know about these? Well, we know there are, they're all nine characters long. Anything that's not nine characters long would be invalid. Um, we know that all of those characters are digits. Anything that's not a digit means it's probably invalid. We also know that if we run the, ch the checker multiple times over the same string, it should always return the same result. Wh this function should not depend on when we run it. It should always return the same result. So if we could write, pro write tests that would prove out properties of our system like this, we would probably have more confidence in our code. So what is property-based testing? I keep talking about it. I keep saying it like you should know what it is. But what actually is it? So property-based testing is, is Typically three different things. It depends on your framework how deep each of those three things works or, or how, how far they go, but three different things make up property-based testing. And the first one is you create a model that specifies specific properties from your functional requirements. So functional requirements are those things that your clients give you. Your client should be telling you the properties of your system. And we should be testing those properties, as opposed to just saying, I've written my own, I've got my own conceptual model. I want to be testing the model that they've given me as well. Next up, we want to generate tests to falsify the properties. Okay, what? 
okay, we just built a model, we built these properties to specify the model, and then we want to falsify it. I want the system, the framework, to generate tests that will tell me where my, my system falls down. I want it to prove my property false so that I can find the bug and fix it before it gets into production. And then finally, we want to determine the minimal failure case. This is something called shrinking. Um, determining what is the, the smallest possible input that can give me an error. And that will help me find my bug as fast as possible. So property-based testing is a higher level of abstraction than unit testing. And developers absolutely love abstraction. I know this because Ivan tells us this. <laughs> abstraction is good. Okay, so let's look at some unit tests just to give you a, an idea of what the heck I'm talking about. What do I fill in the blank with here on my unit test? I'm testing the max function and I'm passing in two integers, one and two. What should my question mark be? Nobody knows? A max function, you pass in one and two? This is not a trick question. <laughs> Too. Okay, cool. All right, whew. You guys are awake again. <laughs> Same thing, we may, if we're writing unit tests for this max function, we'll probably want to test the zero case. If we pass in a one and a zero, we're going to say one is the max. And then I'm probably going to test the negative case as well, just because it's an edge case that's fairly common and it's something that I've thought, oh, somebody may do that and it may break. So I make sure that zero re is returned when passed in with negative two. Cool. Okay, so again, those are just three tests. Does that prove that my function is, is correct? Probably not. Am I ever gonna be able to write or generate enough tests to prove that my function is correct? Probably not. But I do wanna have enough confidence in my code that I can move forward. So here I may write a property that says for all, have two input parameters, x and y, run those through max, and then I can say, I can assert some properties. I can say that Z, in this instance, will always either be X or Y. And then I can also say that Z will always be greater than or equal to X, and Z will be greater than or equal to Y. So see how we've twisted our brains to think just slightly differently about the way we're writing our test? So three different ways, three different steps in, in writing property-based tests. First we specify, and to do that, we almost always start with for all. For all is the uni universal quantifier that says, in every case that I pass in these input parameters, something, some fact about my system, some property of my system, and these tests will pass or fail. They're not proven, it's just gonna pass 10,000 or 100,000 or a million, depending on whatever you've set your configuration to, it's gonna pass X number of tests, or fail. So, here is JavaScript. There's a framework called Claire. Here's an instance where we're just testing a commutative property of, of the addition uh, function. So if we add A to B, it should equal adding B to A. Here's JS Verify, which is another JavaScript framework um, that if we have a function that takes a bool and returns a bool, we pass in any boolean, it will always return the same result if you run it three times or once. Think about that for a second. Who tests like that? It's like a weird way to think about your code. It, it changes the way your brain works. And here's Erlang Quick Check. Here's a really common use case where you would do something like encode some JSON and then decode it to make sure that when you've decoded, you got the same thing that you encoded. I don't generally write unit tests that do this test for me because I've been told that it's wrong, because it, it crosses boundaries of functions and sometimes even classes. What I love about property-based testing is that it gets rid of all that dogma, it gets rid of all the rules, and it allows you to break down barriers. It allows me to break down the barrier of, okay, I've test I wrote all my unit tests that prove all of my one-liners work. However, when I put my one-liners together, it doesn't work anymore, it breaks. The problems exist often between the functions, when you compose the functions together, as opposed to when you just test one line at a time. You find a lot more bugs this way. So exist is the existential quanti quantifier, which means it can be proved, something does exist. 
So in this instance, we're saying, okay, we have a, a, a type or a, an object called conference, and my conference will have a name, and, and it may have a list of keywords. So if I run this test long enough, and I pass in my input parameters, enough of them, I will get code mania and awesome. Okay, I will get that. It's proved. But don't do this. I'm gonna tell you in advance, this is something that you learn in every framework, it, does, it exists that you can do it, however you shouldn't. The reason you shouldn't do it is because it can take a very long time to get something that will work. How many different random strings do you have to pass in before you get code mania and awesome? A lot, it may never happen. It's gonna just send you down rabbit holes. Just write a unit test. That's right, write a unit test. I'm not saying property-based testing completely overtakes all of your testing, Write property-based testing in conjunction with unit testing and in conjunction with all different types of testing. Sometimes instead of writing a property-based test because they do take longer to write or longer to run than a unit test, just write a unit test. So there are many patterns of, of the way you write properties. Most people will start out just by fuzzing. The first time you download the framework, you'll start to say, okay, well, you're right, all those unit tests, they could just be parameterized and I could run things to have, I could run more tests more inputs through those tests to make sure that I have more confidence in my code. So this is called fuzz testing. It's not, it's not what uh, property-based testing was invented for, however, you get a ton of value out of doing it, so why not do it? Every unit test you write, I bet you can come up with a way that you could fuzz test instead. So download a property-based testing framework and start doing that. But what you'll start to do is you'll move towards specifying the model that you'll wanna write more interesting tests about that will help change the way you think about your code. The first pattern that we'll talk about is relations. So often when we're writing tests, we're, we're proving that something relates to something else in some way. So in this instance, I've got two different, um, two different pieces of code that are supposed to do the exact same thing. In this instance, maybe I've been refactoring and I wanna make my code faster. So if I run my commands through fs, and then if I run the same commands through cs, then time one should be less than time two. I know that my refactor did what I want as far as reducing the amount of time that it takes. How often do we refactor in, it's supposed to be faster, and it's only faster in some situations and not all. It's really hard to come up with all the scenarios to test. So property-based testing helps you to do that. I'm not saying that FS means F sharp and CS means C sharp, but I'm not saying it doesn't. <laughs> so here's another instance where we have a ranking system. So we wanna score two different, uh, two different inputs, option one and option two. We run them through our ranking system and we can tell based on certain properties about our inputs whether or not the score should be higher or lower. So here we're just saying X relates to Y in this specific way. So you can see how relations can help you to think about your code in ways that you probably are already thinking this way, you're just not writing the test to prove it. Or that's how I was at least. So the next pattern is the most common pattern. Everybody that you talk to who talks about property-based testing is doing this. Um, reference implementation. This is kind of saying we've got this gold standard that we know that works and we wanna test, it, we wanna test our implementation. So here we say for all, um, I'm gonna use sort, because we test those all the time, right? No, but it gives you an idea of what, what the heck I'm talking about. We've got a bubble sort and a quick sort. We know that the results should be the same. It doesn't, I'm not asking how long one takes versus how long another takes. I'm just saying that the end result should be the same. So here we say the bubble sort result is the same as the quick sort result on the same list. Okay, so here we're testing end state for um, running some commands against a system. So if we run commands against our FS system and we run the same commands against our CS system, we want to assert that the, the end state is the same. What's the problem here? The problem here is the same as the problem with all refactoring, and that's that we often, I often, a lot of people that I work with often, forget that refactoring means that the, no matter how the code looks, you're getting the exact same result in the end. So the code that I wrote in one system and then I rewrote in another system probably had bugs in it. Lots of code has bugs in it. And then we write systems around the systems that have bugs in them. 
Those systems start to depend on the bugs to exist. So if you have state in one system that has a bug and then you re refactored and the bug no longer exists, you've done more than refactoring and those end systems that depend on your systems may not work anymore. There may be an issue there. So this helps us to make sure that we've got the exact same state. Another example can be found on this blog. Jonathan Graham is an eighth light uh, software craftsman and he was trying to make sure that he understood closure so in, in order to learn a new language, one of the easiest ways to do that is to rewrite the base functions of that language in the language. So for instance, he wrote map, pmap, um, filter, several functions that exist within Clojure and wanted to make sure that he fully understood how they were working. So he wrote his own implementation and then he had the, the Clojure core implementation to run the tests against. And you can go to this blog and see exactly how he did it. Our next pattern is round trip or symmetry. And this is something that we've already kind of talked about with our JSON encode and decode to make sure that it's the same thing. Here we've got a list of stuff. So when we reverse and then we reverse the reversal, we should have the same thing back in the beginning. What's interesting here is not this function, it's that sometimes I end up writing functions to undo the thing that I did, even if my system doesn't need it, just so that I can test that my understanding and the system's implementation are, are the same. So sometimes I end up writing extra code, helper functions, in order to, to make sure that I'm doing the right thing in my code. So here we've got um, inserting properties. Okay, so let's test this property um, insert. If I've got a database that's say not Mongo, I can put something in and test that I'm gonna get the same thing back when I call it. Our next pattern is idempotent. And if you listen to Gary's talk this morning, he says that more things should be idempotent. We should be thinking about this property in our system. So how do you test it? How do you, how do you test that that is what it says it is? Well, you can write property-based tests that run the same thing over and over and over again in different situa situations with different scenarios that you can actually generate. In this situation, we're just updating something. If we update something three times to the exact same thing, you should still only have one thing, and it should be the same as what it was when you updated it. So what about concurrency tests? I can see it in your eyes, you're thinking, what about concurrency tests? How do I find race conditions in concurrency tests? Well, so this is kind of a complex answer because every framework has something a little bit different and some don't even address it. If you're using Quivic, which is written by John Hughes, um, it's for Erlang. If you're using Quick Check by Quivic, it's gonna be amazing and the, the concurrency tests are gonna be simple and easy to read and all of that. What you're gonna get in most frameworks in almost every language that we would work with, not as straightforward, not as simple, not as easy, but you don't have to pay for it because most of them are free. But what we do know is that any language that has any kind of concurrency constructs, we can write that code ourselves. If you're writing the code, you should be able to write tests that also implement that same sort of code in order to run the test and check for race conditions. By the time we have any kind of interesting architecture whatsoever, there are going to be bugs that we're going to find no matter if our code is correct or not correct. We're gonna find bugs based on properties that our clients have told us should exist about our system. That doesn't necessarily mean the code is wrong. It just means that there's something we haven't thought about yet. Property-based test errors often lead me to having more conversations with my client, which is a great thing. It helps me to be more agile. It helps me to say, hey guys, what, what should happen here? I'm not sure if this should happen or not. So it brings about more conversations that, that help me to better understand the domain. And quite honestly, it generally helps them to better understand their domain because they can say X should happen and then Y and then they won't actually know what happens when Z pops in there. They don't know. It just happens all the time in systems that they're already working with and they don't know how it works. One great thing about property-based tests is that it helps me to find exceptions. Exceptions that I wasn't expecting, which is fantastic, right? Like if I haven't written code with the expectation that I can get an exception, then I wanna know about it based on the fact that lots and lots of inputs have been pushed through my functions. Um, this is great because I don't even need asserts in some cases. Even if I leave out all the asserts but I write the properties down, it will give me some value. So preconditions are implica logical implication, very similar to um, what we talked about earlier in that we don't wanna run tests if we don't have the preconditions set up correctly. Um, let's just say we're testing something that would be dividing. We don't want our, per our input for the second, um, the second parameter to be zero, you don't wanna divide by zero. 
So in this instance, we're saying, okay, the first thing we should do in our test is check that the number should, does not equal zero. Don't, don't run the test unless it equals zero, or unless it equals a non-zero number. So this is great, until we get more complicated with stuff like this. Okay, so we have a person, we've got inputs that are generated that are persons. Our persons have hair color and they have an age. Don't run the test until you get a person with red hair over 49. The problem with this is that you can run a million through and you may never find somebody who is redhead over 49. Or you may find somebody. Some frameworks have really good um, systems for this where they'll say, well, we'll only run it 10 times and if we can't find anything, we're just gonna fail it. Other systems will run one million of them and then tell you, yeah, we were able to prove it or no, we weren't. So generally don't do that, just write a unit test. So the next, the next part of our talk is generation. Um, a lot of us have already written code to generate data in the past. It's something that's pretty common when you're getting your CS degree or when you're learning to write code and you have to test your own code. So it's just writing code. Writing a generator is just writing code. In this instance, we're returning a tuple with n and two times n. It's just code. So we write our generators in the same way that we would write anything else, just returning data. The cool thing about generators is that they are composable. So here we've got a list of and then we're choosing between two option types, some of something that we're generating or none. And then in the second line, we're generating a list of eight arbitrary integers. So you can compose these things together. Here's something even more complex that I won't bore you with all the details, but if you know Scala, you can see that we're generating cars that have color. So we, we generally, in this case, we would need to generate cars and we would need to make sure that every car as you're creating a car is a type and it has a, a color. So this would just be a, a, some code to do that. So what about generating commands? This is something that you do all the time. Um, in property-based testing, generating commands that you can execute, assist, execute against a system to validate the results is really, really common. So um, you use lambdas. Essentially, you use lambdas to create your commands. You execute a list of those lambdas against your system before you execute them, this is where you actually do use preconditions because you may need to say if my command is a get, I need to make sure that somebody has previously put that that data will actually be there. So this is where preconditions do come in handy. Um, and then you execute them to check the, the resulting state. So something to be aware of is generators generate different data every single time you run them. So if you find an error based on the generated data, write a unit test for regression. Because if you don't do that, you, will not, you may not generate that same bug next time. And then if somebody changes the code, they can reintroduce that bug into the system. And then finally, shrinking. Um, shrinking is how you take the, the failing example and you produce a smaller version of that failure so that you can tell what's the, what's the simplest possible failure that they need to go debug. So just to make that pretty simple, if you look at the first couple of lines, we've got a list. Um, the parameter that failed, the input that failed was a list, and somewhere in that list was an empty string. So that says the arg original. The arg zero is the shrunken version of that, which says that the minimum failing test case is really just a list with an empty string in it. So anytime you have an empty string in a list, that's gonna give you a bug. Go, fix, go look for that. It's much easier than looking for an arbitrary long list that somewhere in it existed an empty string. And then the second example is negative 1432 was reduced to uh, negative one. So what we know is all negative numbers fail. So all negative numbers failing is important information. Negative 1432, you may, you may not know exactly how that failed or why that failed. It may take you some time to find out that, oh yeah, all negative numbers will fail. So if you write a generator, you're gonna have to write a shrinker as well. Um, and you do that by writing a function that reduces your input, the type of your input, one step closer to the minimum failing result. The more intricate your generator, the less likely you are to write a shrinker. And that's okay, because knowing that there's a bug is the first step. Um, there are many, many configurations that you can tweak in order to run your property-based tests the most effective way possible. Things like run a hundred through, one, run a thousand through. If I'm, if I'm working in my, my laptop, my local box, and I'm trying to go fast, I want a quick feedback loop, maybe just run 10 examples through. If I'm going to production tomorrow, maybe run 100,000 to make sure that I have great confidence in my code. There are many, many different configurations like this. 
So this should all seem really simple and really obvious. Hopefully at this point you're thinking like, why, why wouldn't I go out and try this? Um, and there may be some final thoughts that, you, that you're coming up with. Like what about TDD, I do TDD. Well, I talked to John Hughes, the guy who wrote Quick Check, and he said, yeah, I do TDD with Quick Check. He's like, you're supposed to write your properties first. You define the properties of your system and then you write the code to make them pass. Um, in my experience, property-based tests live longer than unit tests, and that's because I don't comment them out, because I, I pay more attention to them. <laughs> unit tests should not be brittle, and a lot of people have given me all the ways that I should write unit tests to make them less brittle, but still in my code base always, and maybe it's a fault in me, maybe it's a fault in all of you as well, you probably have commented out unit tests somewhere. Um, Property-based tests find different sorts of bugs for me. They're not just the one-line bug like, oh yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that was gonna be negative one as an issue. Like, almost anybody can look at a single line of code and say, yeah, that caused a bug. It's when you compose these functions together, when you have many, many lines of code, that you get bugs that are harder to find. Um, there's a lot less code to maintain in the fact that I'm not writing a million unit tests. However, I am writing much more complex code. My property-based tests are not as simple as my unit test. It's normally, it's more than three or four lines of code. Um, there are helper functions, which any good unit tester will tell you that every piece of data, every piece of information in that unit test should be just within those five or 10 lines of code. Um, but within property-based tests, it's just not the case. You've got generators, you've got helper functions. They're, they're more complex. So that's something to be wary of. Um, and then use them in conjunction with other tests. Don't just write property-based tests. Please don't go back to your office and say, but Amanda said, no more unit tests. But do try and start doing some fuzzing so you have inputs to your unit tests. 